Praise God. I'm so glad to be with you. And I'm so excited because I know the Lord has something that is powerfully transformative in store for you because there have been so many things that have tried to dissuade me and oppose me from being here to share this word with you. And so uh, I'm just really excited that you've made the time to have space and room to receive the prophetic word of God in this year of Jubilee. I'm going to pray in just a minute, uh, but I do want to tell you this is about Jubilee. So if you have not heard our previous two messages about this season that we're in called Jubilee and the restorative nature of it and how it is on God's calendar, I encourage you to go back and look at and listen to if podcast is your preference to those messages so that you'll be prepared for what I'm going to say. I'm trying to keep these messages a little shorter. Uh, so they're easier for you to grasp, easier for you to digest, easier for you to get in their totality so that you can pray through them and receive what God has for you. So I don't want to do a whole lot of backtracking. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the ability to fight. Fight for our inheritance, to have the heart of Caleb, God, to take the mountain that you've proclaimed is ours away from the evil one. We bless you for this and we thank you for your prophetic word that gives us the word in season so that we might apprehend your heart and your mind. Uh, wherever we are and whatever time that we are in, whatever season we're in, we are so grateful. Now I ask God that you take over my mind and my heart. May the meditations of my heart and the words of my mouth be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I do want to abide in the tabernacle in, of God, and I want him to hide me right now because what I say to you right now, I want it to be the heart of the Lord. Sure, he can use my personality, but I want it to be the word of God. So I've been continuing to pray in Ju into Jubilee for this year, and it is worth you going and looking into Leviticus 25 to get the biblical foundations for Jubilee and what it means for restoring your inheritance. It is in God's calendar. And so we bless God for the opportunity to apprehend some things that the enemy has taken or has had possession of, such as our peace, such as financial breakthroughs, such as relationships uh, that have been broken things of that nature, even health issues that are connected to familiar spirits, generational curses, things that the enemy has had possession of that he has no right to uh, continue to have possession of, God has built into his calendar for you to receive those things. So we thank you, God, for that. So I've been praying into this, and this is what the Lord revealed to me uh, a couple of weeks ago and, and just have not been able to get on here and release it to you, but here we are today. And just so you know, you might hear some construction work going on behind me, but I had to release this word. And so I'm not uh, changing locations. I'm not gonna try to do this another time. I pray that the, the Lord will make room and space for me to say this without there being distractions in Jesus name. So as we walk through this year of Jubilee, many of us are gonna feel like we're still in the wilderness and we have not yet found our inheritance, our promised land. That God wants you to move into your promised line, land. But truly, some of us are going to have to fight for the enemy to give us what is ours. So for this, I want to go to Joshua chapter 14. And I'm going to read this to you. And this is going to bless you. I, I know it's going to bless you. Joshua 14. And we're going to start at verse 6 and read through verse 15. It says, Then the children of Judah came to Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite said to him, quote, you know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. The servant of the Lord sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord of my God. So what he's saying is when other people didn't have faith, I had faith. He's testifying about his faithfulness to God. So Moses swore on that day saying, quote, surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. So here we are, Caleb, reminding the Lord, reminding the man of God of what God said about his inheritance and how it was his and it would be in his children's uh, possession forever. Glory to God. And it was given to him because of his faith. Is that speaking to anybody today? In verse 10, it says, now behold, the Lord has kept me alive. Say, I'm alive. As he said, these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now here I am this day, 85 years old. It has been 45 years since he received the word of the Lord about his inheritance. And he is still waiting 45 years later. As yet, I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. I'm going to stop right there. You have the strength. Though you have waited long, though the Lord has been bearing long with you as you've been praying for restoration of some things in your life, you are just as strong in faith now 
as you were when you began to pray. You are just as strong in faith now as you were when you first believed. In fact, I want to say to you and prophesy to your spirit, you are stronger now in spirit than you ever have been. And the Lord has brought you to this place. He knew you before you were in your mother's womb. He wanted you to be alive for this jubilee season so that you would apprehend what he has for you. And he knew there would be an intersection of your childlike, strong faith in God and the jubilee. And those two together are unstoppable. I want you to speak that out loud. I am unstoppable because of the faith I have in God. I am unstoppable because of the faith I have in God. Do not relent in your fighting in prayer. You are just as strong as you were when you first heard God say, this is my word for your life. What have you given up on that God said, no, 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 return back to my promises. In verse 12, it says, now, therefore, give me this mountain, say mountain, of which the Lord spoke in that day. For you heard in that day how the Anakim were there and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. What is Caleb talking about? That in his inheritance, the space God said is yours because he had faith when others did not. It still is occupied by giants. Somebody say giants in the land. There are giants in the land trying to inhabit and possess and care for and take from you and keep from you that which is rightfully yours. But God has given you strength. Somebody say I'm strong in the Lord. Verse 13, and it says at this moment, Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance. Let's stop right here. Joshua represents Jesus Christ. Joshua, his name means the same thing as Yeshua, Jesus. It means the Lord is salvation. And so he represents Jesus. So Jesus Christ himself has blessed you to receive your, your Hebron, your inheritance. Glory to God. And then it says, Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite, to this day, because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. So it says from that moment, Jesus, the moment Jesus said to you, this is yours, it is yours in the name of Jesus. No matter who or what is taking uh, possession of that land or inhabits that possession or inhabits your inheritance or has uh, taken your inheritance, no matter what is there right now, Jesus said it is yours. And so you have the strength in faith to take what is yours because God gave it to you and has given you the grace to receive it. Somebody bless his name. And it says, uh, verse 15, and the name of Hebron was Kerjath Arba. Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim. Then the land had rest from war. Listen, even the strongest giant can't keep you from your inheritance. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to hasten, but I want you to hear this. Even the strongest giant cannot keep you from your inheritance. I, I feel like I'm going to have to prophesy over you as I release this prophetic word. I need to give you personal prophetic ministry to keep fighting in prayer. Listen, that doesn't mean you've got to be as Jesus with you, with you praying on your face until uh, drops of sweat and blood are coming out of your pores. What I'm saying is to be faithful in prayer, to be as Caleb saying, give me my mountain and perhaps the Lord will allow me to, to wipe out every giant in the land. He was saying this because he had been committed to receiving that he had been promised for two generations, for a generation and a half or roughly. What is it in your family that has been promised to your family through God by Jesus Christ that you have been ordained to receive in this jubilee season on behalf of your whole, your whole bloodline? The truth is this, the enemy is a lawbreaker and a trespasser. So we cannot be surprised when we don't have all that God has promised us because the enemy is a lawbreaker. He steals, he trespasses, he takes things that doesn't, don't belong to him. He puts himself where he does not belong, where he does not have legal right to be. Where you are experiencing warfare is always a place where the enemy is looking to take away what is rightfully yours in Christ Jesus. I'm going to say that again. Where you are experiencing warfare is always a place where the enemy is trying to take something that is rightfully yours in Christ Jesus. We can take great joy and encouragement from Caleb, who after 45 years of fighting, came to Joshua and made a demand for his inheritance. I want you to make a demand for your inheritance in the spirit. Go into the courtroom of heaven and go before the righteous judge and say, Jesus' blood testifies that I am righteous and the spirit of the living God is my advocate. And the enemy might come and accuse me, but I declare that what Jesus' blood proclaims over me is mine. Pray and believe. Caleb had been faithful and yet he had not yet walked into his inheritance. And this is where we can run into problems, where we've, been, we've begun to start asking ourselves, what did we do wrong? No, it's Christ's righteousness. 
yes, we are called to agree with Christ. So there might be things in your life that you are doing that are uh, not allowing you to walk in the fullness of God's calling on your life. And so be available to those things. But sometimes we get into this distraction mode where we begin to overanalyze and say, well, what am I doing wrong? When, when it's just literally you got to fight and pray. And this generation, Jesus called a faithless generation. This generation is called a faithless generation. Why did Jesus call us that? Because that which was found in Noah cannot be found in this world. Noah heard a word from God and over the course of hundreds of years built an ark. That type of faith is not in the earth anymore. And so what the Lord had to do is what he did in the book of Judges. He has to leave demonic influence in our midst to force us to pray, to force us to grow up and mature in our faith, because faith is what pleases God. It is impossible to please him without faith. So he allows, just like it's spoken in Judges chapter 2, he allows the demonic to stay in the land to force his people to their knees and to cry out. So this is about building you into an image of Jesus Christ, building you to an image of God, a person of faith who relies on the Father, not on anything that you can see. God is purifying his bride. So he had been faithful and yet had not walked into his inheritance after 45 years hearing the promise. He was wandering as he fought. So he was fighting for other people. Is that your testimony? You're ministering to other people, you're helping other people, but you're still waiting on God for some things for you. You feel like you're wandering, you're, not, you're in the wilderness still. Caleb was a faithful warrior. Is that your testimony? You've been faithful to God. But he had not found rest in his rightful place of inheritance for himself and for his children's children. So it does not mean that because you've not yet found that space that you've been disqualified. It does not mean that you've been out of the will of God. It might mean that it just had, just had not been the time yet because the Lord wanted to build into you an image of Jesus Christ that otherwise would not have been built if you had easily just walked into your inheritance. What did he do in the wilderness with the people of God? He began to teach them how he needed to be the center of their lives. That's why they camped around the presence. And he began to show them his nature and character and his power and his purpose and his love and his heart, the sacrifices that they gave and how much he was going to give for them. He was trying to break their hearts like his is broken, a, a fresh, beautiful heart each and every day for them to love their neighbor as they love God. But he had to teach that generation who had not seen what happened at the Red Sea, who were not there to witness God's power when the, the, the angel of death came and the Passover lamb protected the people of God. They weren't there to witness that. And so their testimony came with them, but the people, the younger generation, had not walked in the same amount of faith. They had not experienced what can happen by uh, radical faith yet. And so God had to put them in a wilderness over the course of 40 years to teach them this. And this is what Caleb had to wait through. He was in the older generation, and the Lord allowed him to walk through the younger generation, that which he already knew. And yet he still had not walked into the promise for his children and children's children. So Joshua, again, is a type of Christ in this story. His name means Jehovah's salvation. He is a picture of salvation. He is an image of Christ. He is a Christ-like illustration in this story. So imagine yourself going to Jesus like Caleb and demanding your place of rest, your place of worship. This was about him getting a mountain. Mountain represents worship. He wanted his mountain, a place where he could go and serve and honor the Lord, and his family could too. I'm blessing you right now in the name of Jesus with an Obed-Edom anointing, where the, where the testimony of the word of God is that the, the, the spirit of the Lord, the Ark of the Covenant, was in Obed-Edom's house for three months, and his house was blessed. That is what God wants for you. Eden in your household, a rest in worship, to walk in the cool of the day with the Father, to hear his voice, to walk in abundance, to walk in fullness of peace and presence and fellowship with the Lord. That is what he has for you. So again, mountains represent worship in the word of God. Some of us are worshiping in places that we have gotten used to inhabiting, but God has a higher place of worship for you, a deeper place, and the enemy wants to keep you from that place. What did he say to Pharaoh? He said, Moses said to Pharaoh, because God told him, he said, let my people go that they may worship me. God sets you free so that you can have fellowship with him. And so from the moment you came to Christ, from the moment he even thought of you before the foundations of the world, his heart for you was to be in fellowship with him, to walk with him in the cool of the day in the garden. 
to be with him in the tabernacle, to tabernacle with him, to be in his tent, to be intimate with him, to be in his bedchamber, to be with God naked and unashamed, to be on one accord with the, with the Lord. That is where we should be inhabiting. And we need to have a fighting spirit like Caleb to inhabit that for ourselves and our children's children. You might think that after Caleb made his demand, the war would be over. Instead, we find the same giants that were in the land 45 years ago were still there. So they had already crossed the Jordan. <laughs> they had fought. The Bible literally says that there was a rest in the land. And Caleb was still not in receipt of his inheritance at that time because where God had for him to inhabit and worship the Lord was still being inhabited by giants. And these giants represent familiar spirits or demonic presence that has historically taken residence somewhere, such as your family or bloodline, your household, or the bulk of your life. There could be demonic spirits that have just been present in your life and influencing your life for too long. And the Lord wants to assist you in getting rid of those giants. That is the word of the Lord. The Lord wants to assist you in getting rid of those giants. He will anoint you like David with faith. Faith is the key. You've got to believe you have the victory and refuse to lose. Keep praying and believing. Take the word of God and go to battle. You have the victory. You've got to look at what happened with Caleb. Caleb was anointed to battle to take the land that had been promised for him. He had been anointed to take what God had for him. No matter what was there, no matter how big those giants were, Caleb had the anointing to take them out. Who better for the Lord to empower than the man who is the rightful owner of the inheritance? So make that personal. Who better for God to anoint than the person who's rightfully uh, the person to take it, to take the land? Jesus says, I am yours. So who better for him to, to anoint, to apprehend all he has for you than you? You are anointed to take what's yours because it's yours. Now listen to what happened with Caleb in Joshua 15. I got to hasten. It says, this is later, Jaleb, the son, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who gave share among the children of Judah, according to the, the commandment of, of the Lord to Joshua, he drove out the three sons of Anak who were there. Okay. Then he went up from there to the inhabitants of Debir. And Caleb said, he who attacks Kerjath Sepher and takes it, to him I will give Aksa my daughter as wife. So Othniel, the son of Kenaz, the brother of Caleb, took it, and he gave Aksa his daughter as a wife. Now it was so when she came to him that she persuaded him to ask her father for a field. So she dismounted from her donkey. This is his daughter. And Caleb said to her, what do you wish? She answered, give me a blessing. Since you have given me the land in the south, give me also springs of water. So he gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. What are we talking about? Generational blessing. So Caleb goes to Joshua, says, I want my mountain. Joshua blesses him. He goes while the rest of the land has rest. He takes out the sons of Anak. And then he makes a challenge. He says, whoever takes out the sons of Debir, I'm going to give you my daughter. Othniel goes, his brother, and takes out Debir. He gets his daughter, but his daughter's not satisfied. She's got security in her husband that represents Christ. You have security in your bridegroom, Jesus Christ, but you still can come to Jesus and require more and say, no, that's not enough. I have this, but I also want this. She wanted spring. She wanted refreshment. She wanted the, the, the spiritual fountain of daily replenishment of the spirit of God. That's what the, the, the spring represents. This daily refreshing in the fountain of the Lord, that is for you, that worship experience. And it's generational. It's not, it wasn't just for Caleb. It was for his daughter as well to apprehend. And her husband ended up being one of the judges. So she marries into a, a person who is to uh, care for, uh, bless, and protect the people of God. So the next generation is carrying over to occupy the land. This is what God has for you in your household generational blessing regardless of your gender regardless of your age caleb broke open god's blessing for his entire household but first he had to take on three giants and this same land is where the people of god met with the lord for generations until david uh, took jerusalem hebron is the same place where abraham worshiped the lord after god told him to look at the sky and imagine his descendants as the stars in the sky and caleb then reconnected the people of god back to the land of their fathers 
This is the place Abraham buried Sarah. And look at how Caleb's determination to fight reconnected the people of God to their forefathers in the original Abrahamic blessing, which was you are blessed, I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. He reconnected God, God's people, his household to the original blessing, and that's your call. That's your call, to reconnect the people in your household to the original blessing. Glory to God. I bless you. I'm going to have to make a part two of this. There's a part two. We need to talk about how spirits try to come back and what we've got to do. But let me pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for the anointing to fight. I pray for the anointing to not give in. I pray for the anointing to trust in the faith you've given us. You said you've given everyone a measure of faith. You've given all of us enough faith for what we need. You gave Caleb enough faith to take out giants. You gave his brother enough faith to take out more opposition. You gave his daughter enough faith to receive a generational blessing, regardless of the fact that she was not male. Glory to Jesus. She didn't allow the discriminatory practices of her culture to remove from her her access to the inheritance. I speak to your daughters right now, those who have been told they're not this or they're not that or they're this and they shouldn't be that. God, I pray that they wipe off all of those tears and those lies and the smears in the name of Jesus and they will apprehend everything you have for them. Those who have been... Uh, God, I bless those who have been involved in domestically violent relationships, that they will not uh, think themselves as those who are victims, and yet they've been victimized, but they are not victims. No, they are Esthers in the spirit. They are Deborahs in the spirit. Glory to God. We thank you for them in Jesus' name, that they will rise up and say, give me my mountain and my spring. Come on, my shah. And we thank you for the generational impact, God, of all of this, being married to the bridegroom and how we will be able to occupy, not just receive, but occupy so that the enemy can't uh, take it back. Teach us that next time, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, I praise God for you. $20,000 uh, giving campaign for our international mission work. I'm heading to Kenya in a couple of weeks here uh, because it's the first week of February. I'm making this, this recording. And uh, we've been invited to go all over the world. And so we really want to fund that if, if God has it for us. So, yes, we'd love for you to connect with us at faithfireworldwide.com. That's also where you can find our prophetic blog uh, where many of these messages are posted. And, and there is also text versions uh, so that you can read this in your private time as well. We just thank you. If you're watching us on YouTube, share this. We pray that you'll like this, that you'll subscribe. Uh, we want to see momentum with the word of the Lord. If you're listening to this, we thank God for you. We pray that you will pray into this, even share this with someone and connect with us on our newsletter so you'll know uh, what's going on with our ministry. You can do that at faithfireworldwide.com. Listen, until next time, I pray God will bless you and keep you, be gracious to you, that his face will shine on you, that he will lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Until then, God bless you and bye-bye.